I said to you, I'd give my right arm for a pen like that one you have. Now, I think we would probably realize that's a statement that's known literarily as a hyperbole. But how would you reply to that statement? Would you say to me, hey, all right, Pastor Dan, just cut your right arm off and hand it to me and I'll be glad to give you my pen. That seems like a fair deal. Is, is that how you would respond to that statement? Or what if I said to you, you keep eating hamburgers and pizza every day and you're going to kill yourself. Well, that's a, a well-meaning but overstated kind of thing to say to someone. It's truthful, but it's an overstatement because it, it doesn't take other factors into consideration uh, like your current weight, uh, your cholesterol level, uh, your overall diet, and your amount of exercise. So I just say, if you eat hamburgers and pizza, you're going to die. You're going to kill yourself. So how would you respond to me if I said that to you? Oh, Pastor Dad, okay. Will you please tell my family that I love them? And will you do the funeral for me? Because I ate a hamburger and a pizza today. You'd say, no, I, I, I know that's not what you meant. I know what you said, and it was well-meaning, and I understand it, but uh, that's not the proper response because that's not what was meant. But how do you know that that's not what was meant? Do you understand that what I said was not what I meant? <laughs> what did I do? Did I lie to you? No, because you understood what I meant. Rather than some strict literal interpretation of what I said. Now, for example, <clears throat> when Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out and cast it away. And if your right arm offends you, cut it off and throw it into the fire. What? Well, intuitively, you kind of say, well, I know what he said, uh, but I think I understand what he meant, and it's not exactly what he said. Now, some people, sadly, down through the ages, have read that scripture very literally and have maimed themselves. And that's what happens when you misunderstand and take what was said instead of what was meant. Now, for, I'll give you some more examples. According to Luke 14, Jesus said that you must hate your mother and father. Remember reading that? And you must hate your spouse and your children. Okay. And then in Luke 6, Jesus says, but you must love your enemies. Say what? I hate my mom and dad, I, I, I hate my spouse and my kids, but I love my enemies? What in the world is going on here? Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, again, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And then later on in Matthew, he says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. What is going on here? What, what gives with all of this? I learned a lesson about biblical interpretation, and the fancy word for that is hermeneutics, but I learned about biblical interpretation one time from something my wife taught me. Let me tell you the story, and I'll explain what I mean. Uh, my wife has this adorable habit of speaking without antecedents. So one day <clears throat> she said to me, would you get my keys for me? And I'm like, uh, which keys? Y you know, the keys I use. <laughs> okay, where are they? They're in the drawer. Uh, 
we have a lot of drawers in this house. Which drawer? You know, the drawer in the kitchen. There are a lot of drawers in the kitchen. Now, I'm, here's the irony. I know exactly which keys she means. I know exactly where they are. But I'm going to play with her. So I'm going, well, where are they? Well, you, 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 you know the drawer where I keep my keys. And finally she says to me, will you stop listening to what I say and start listening to what I mean? And I thought, that's profound. That is profound because that is an excellent rule for biblical interpretation. And we're going to see how that rule applies today. That is a key to properly understanding sections of the Bible. It's not what it says, it's what it means. We seek the meaning of Scripture. Now in our pericope for today, which is going to be Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31, which is a part of Jesus' sermon on the level place in the Gospel of Luke, we're going to have to seek meaning rather than the literal wording in order to get the proper interpretation and application of Jesus' teaching. Now, Jesus wanted his teaching to make an impression on people, and he wanted his teaching to be memorable. And, of course, Matthew and Luke also wanted their readers to uh, sit up and take notice of what Jesus said, of how to live a Christian life. So, in this teaching, Jesus used several forms of expression to make an impact. And we've just seen a couple or three examples of that already. Now, we ask the question, what literary devices did Jesus use to make a point? Well, he used, as we've discussed, hyperbole. Now, using hyperbole means using an exaggeration for vivid effect and to make a teaching memorable. Now, you might say to me, are you telling me, Pastor, that Jesus exaggerated? Did Jesus exaggerate? You be the judge. Jesus said we should take the log out of our own eye before we take the splinter out of our neighbors. Say what? A log? I know what a log is. Take the log out of my eye? I think that's an exaggeration. But it's not a lie. Now, for those of you familiar with Star Trek, and if you're not, and you really want to understand the Bible, you need to understand Star Trek. <laughs> but for those of you who are familiar with Star Trek, you may remember Commander Spock, who's a Vulcan from the planet Vulcan. And he's asked in one of the uh, shows, Mr. Spock, is it true that Vulcans never lie? And he replies, yes, it is true. Vulcans never lie, but we do sometimes exaggerate. You lied. I exaggerated. Oh. So, is an exaggeration always a lie? Not always, sometimes it is. Sometimes an exaggeration is just a lie, okay? But a lie is when you attempt to deceive someone. And there are times when you use an exaggeration not to deceive them. They know you've exaggerated. And they understand that you're really trying to make the point very, very clear by using a vivid example of exaggeration, such as take the log out of your eye. Whoa, that's vivid. I can, I can picture that. I know that's not literal. I know you're exaggerating, but I get the point, and the point of what you're saying is absolutely true and absolutely valid, and you've made that very clear to me. Now, Jesus also used a similar teaching technique, which we would call overstatement. Overstatement. Now, what's the difference between a hyperbolic exaggeration and an overstatement? 
Well, the hyperbolic exaggeration is usually grossly unrealistic and or impossible, uh, such as you have a log in your eye. That's impossible. Uh, that's grossly exaggerated. No. An overstatement is an exaggeration for emphasis, but it's not something that's absolutely impossible, but rather it's something that is ideal. Uh, it's a level of perfection, but it's offered apart from any mitigating circumstances. For example, you eat pizza and hamburger every day, you're going to kill yourself. There's truth in that statement, but I'm ignoring factors like your weight, your cholesterol level, your level of exercise, your overall diet and all that. I, I'm laying aside all of that, which I hope you'll understand, but I'm trying to make a point, is that probably hamburgers and pizza every day are not healthy for you. So that's an overstatement. Now, overstatements carefully have to be taken in context to arrive at an accurate meaning and application. They have to be taken in the context of mitigating circumstances. Overstatements in the Bible must be understood in the context, listen to this, in the context, that's a key word, overstatements must be understood in the context of the pericope or text in which they occur. Read the whole section, not just the verse, read the whole section. Uh, and in fact, read the whole book and get it in context. So it must be in the context of the pericope or the author's literary purposes for the book. It must be in the context of the literary genre used. Is it a poem? Is it a parable? Is it a narrative? What is it? And in the context of the entire New Testament. Now, if Jesus says, pluck, pluck out your eye and cut off your arm, and you can read the New Testament and even the Old Testament and find out, no, you shouldn't do that. So in the context, you must say, well, then that's not literally what it means. It must mean something uh, symbolic. It's an overstatement. One of my favorite little lines is that any text without a context is a pretext. And you might remember that when someone quotes scripture at you. If you take a scripture out of context, some people say, you know, you can prove anything from the Bible. Well, I'd say you can prove almost anything from the Bible if you take your scripture out of context. Yeah. But if you put it in the proper context, you're going to get the meaning, the proper meaning of the scripture that you're quoting. So we're going to find out that Jesus' teaching and the Sermon on the Plain and Luke is, guess what? Overstatement. Overstatement. Now, with those literary tools at our disposal, let's go to Luke chapter 6 and examine verses 27 through 31 and seek properly to understand and interpret Jesus' teaching so that we can properly apply it in our lives. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31. This is a new part. You remember last week we talked about the Beatitudes and the woes. But this is a new part of the Sermon on the Level Place that comes after the Beatitudes and the Woes. And what we're going to see here is verses 27 through 29 have a context. And the context is dealing with conflict. Dealing with conflict caused by the enemies of Christ. In other words, what we might call conflict due to religious persecution. So that's kind of the general context of how we should take these verses, religious persecution for being a Christian. So Jesus says, verse 27, but to you who are listening, now that implies his disciples because they're the ones truly listening to what he has to say, but to you who are listening, I say, that's emphatic, I say, love your enemies. 
well, who are your enemies? Well, in this context, they're those people who are persecuting you for religious reasons. They're persecuting you because you're a Christian. So what's your attitude toward these people? You will cut their heads off. No, 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 no. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Act nice. <laughs> Be as nice as you can to people who hate you for being a Christian. Now, you've got several verbs here and commands. Listen to the commands. Love, do good, and now bless. Honor in speech. Bless those who curse you. Don't curse them back. Say, well, double, double on you. <laughs> if they curse you, you would still be nice. Don't respond to that. So bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And that means physically abuse. Now notice, don't bless those who physically abuse you. <laughs> Not what it says. It says, what do you do for them that physically abuse you because you're a Christian? Pray for them. Pray for them. They're your enemies. You'd like them to be your friend. You'd like them to be like Saul, the Pharisee, who was an enemy but was struck down on the road to Damascus and became the Apostle Paul, a friend. That's what you would like. So you pray for them. Pray for your enemies. Now continuing on with religious persecution, verse 29. If someone slaps you on one cheek, Turn to them the other also. Now, some people have taken this, well, that means we should be pacifists. And we should never fight. We certainly should not go to war. Uh, we, we shouldn't resist evil. We should just be doormats and lie there and take abuse without doing anything. It's not what it says, it's not what it means, it's not in the context. Let's look at it. If someone slaps you on the cheek. Now, why would someone slap you on the cheek? Well, anciently the word there meant jaw, but it came to mean specifically the cheek. Now notice, what does it say? Someone is slapped, why, does someone, why would someone slap you on the cheek? Well, in the synagogue in those days, if you were a heretic or you blasphemed, guess what would happen? You got slapped on the cheek. So what do you think was happening to Christians in the synagogue? They were getting slapped on the cheek. Now notice it doesn't say punched in the face or kicked in the gut. <laughs> it says slapped in the face. That's an insult. What should you do as a Christian to respond to insults? Say insult me again. Slap me on one cheek, I turn to you the other also. There you go. Now, that reminds me of a story. There was a famous heavyweight boxer, and he was a devoted Christian, and he devoted some of his time to labor at his local church. So he got dressed up in his work clothes, and he went down to do some yard work at his local church, and some young punks came up and saw him digging in the dirt and dirty and so forth. And they began to make fun of him working there in the dirt, digging and planting and so forth. And so they made fun of him. And so one of them walked up to him and just slapped him on the cheek. And the heavyweight boxer said, My Lord has said, if they slap you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. And so he turned his other cheek, and sure enough, the punk slapped him on the other cheek. And the heavyweight boxer said, The Lord has given me no further commands on this issue, so here you go. Bam, bam, bam! Now, you see, that could be a response if you take it literally. <laughs> like, okay, you got your two slaps in, now I'm going to knock the stuffing out of you. That's not what it means. So if someone takes your coat, your outer garment, do not withhold your shirt, your undershirt, your undergarment from them. Now, what's that talking about? Well, it could be someone who takes it because they're needy and they're cold and they, t they steal your jacket. And you, go, you know, you need that jacket more than I do, Fred. 
Here, take my sweatshirt as well. Now, it could mean that. It also could mean that uh, it's talking about seizing things as a, as a pledge. And according to the Old Testament, if you gave someone your coat or your undershirt as a pledge on a loan or something or to do some action for them in the future, uh, and they took not only your undershirt but your coat as well, kind of reversing it, you had the right, according to the law, to eventually demand your coat back even if you hadn't paid the loan or done the thing that you promised to do. So what's the point here? What does it mean? This is what it says. What it says is, first of all, be kind and generous, particularly to those who have need, but also don't demand everything you've got coming to you. If you owe someone something, be fair, and be generous, and be understanding about it. So if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Verse 30. <clears throat> Give to everyone who asks you. Now, is that an overstatement or what? So give to everyone who asks you. Hey, Dad, I want a new car. Why, sure, son. You're only 12, but yeah. Because you ask and I've got to give it to you, the Lord said. <laughs> well, that's what the Lord said. But that's not what the Lord meant. You don't give to people things that are not good for them. He says, if anyone asks you, give it. Well, what if they're an alcoholic and they ask for a bottle of liquor? No. What if they're a drug addict and they ask for a new syringe? No. I'm not going to give something to you that's going to hurt you. So I know Jesus said to anyone who asks you for something, give it to them. But that's not what it means. You've got to understand it in the context of the whole message and the Gospel of Luke and the teachings of the New Testament. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Steals, takes, what does it mean demand it back? Like I'm going to kill you if you don't give that back to me? Don't demand it back? You know, it doesn't say don't ask for it back. It says don't demand it. There may be extenuating circumstances. And again, what is the things about an overstatement? They don't take into consideration mitigating circumstances. Everything has to be interpreted in the light of circumstances. So what does it mean on the surface? On the surface, it just generally means to be generous, kind, and forgiving. But it doesn't cover every possibility in every circumstance. So if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it. You can ask for it, but don't demand it. Don't threaten them. Don't pull a gun on them. Try to work this out. And then what's been called the golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. That's beautiful, isn't it? Do to others as you. Say, you know what? I like really getting, I, I really like getting poked with a hot iron. I know I'm a little funny in the head, but I really like getting poked. Uh, so I'm going to do that to you. No. You can't take it literally for exactly what the words say. You've got to take it for what it means. You, you've got to understand people's situations. You've got to be patient. You've got to be merciful as a Christian. What's the point here? We, we love people. We don't always love what people do. But we love the people anyway. And it's not love to tell people that what they're doing wrong is okay. <laughs> Say, well, you stole from me, but that's all right. Just keep it. Or you borrowed that money from me and you said you'd pay it back and you didn't. That's okay. Don't worry about it. You punched me in the head, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. No, it's not okay. First of all, it's not good for you to be behaving like that. 
And I love you enough to tell you that it's not good for you to be behaving like that. Now, I'm not going to shoot you dead. I'm not going to try to intentionally bring harm to you. But I am going to tell you for your own good. What you're doing is not right. The not appropriate behavior. What Jesus is saying here is don't demand quid pro quo. Got to learn to speak another language here, don't you? Don't demand quid pro quo. What does that mean? It means something for something. Don't demand that. Say, well, I gave you a cup of coffee yesterday. I expect a bagel from you today. And if you want me to keep giving you coffee, you're going to have to keep giving me bagels. Because I just don't give away free coffee. Why not? Don't expect quid pro quo every time you turn around. You do something nice for somebody and they don't return the favor? That's okay. No quid pro quo. No lex talionis. That is a good one for you. No lex talionis. That means the law of retribution. You may be more familiar with it as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's what it says in Deuteronomy, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus is basically saying, no. There's no quid pro quo. There's no lex talionis. There's no you did it to me or I did it to you. Now, in Leviticus 24, verse 19, if you don't understand eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and you, and you want to go for the meaning rather than what it says, you take a look at that verse. Because what it says there is that if you cause an injury to a person, you should be injured in the same way. If you get into a car accident and accidentally wreck with someone and, and they lose their leg, the law in Leviticus says you should have your leg chopped off too. If you do something that causes someone else harm, then they ought to harm you in exactly the same way. That's what the Old Testament says. So you're playing baseball with your, with your son, let's say, out in the front yard. You throw the ball really hard. Your son misses it, and it hits the neighbor in the head. According to the book of Leviticus, the neighbor gets to come over and take that baseball and ram it right into your head and go, now we're even. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, lex talionis, quid pro quo. You know what Jesus says? No. If you throw that baseball and hit your neighbor in the head, what do you do? You, I am so sorry. Forgive me. Can I help you? Do you need a bandage? Should I call 911? I'll pay for your medical bills. But don't hit me in the head with a baseball because I did it. Jesus is saying kindness, generosity, compassion, understanding. That's what Jesus meant. Okay, let's look at Luke 6, verses 32 through 36. Love for enemies. Verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit, what charis, what gift, what favor, what honor? What honor? Credit is that to you. Even sinners, people who are not Christians, uh, people who live according to the world standards, not according to Christian standards. Even sinners love those who love them. Well, again, that, that's an overstatement. <laughs> but you have to go for the meaning, even the fact that that's overstated and doesn't take into account every circumstance. But even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit, what charis, what honor is that to you? Even sinners do that. Uh, yeah, yes and no. But you get the point. It's an overstatement to make a point. And what's, what's the point? Is go beyond reciprocity. Go beyond eye for an eye. Go beyond uh, you did this to me, I'm going to do this to you. Or you were bad to me, I'm going to be bad to you. Let's get beyond that. That's not how Christians behave. We do good even to those who do bad to us. 
That doesn't mean we have to sit there and take the bat. But it does mean that we ought not retaliate. Say, you stepped on my toe, I've got a gun. I'm going to retaliate for what you just did. No. If they say, I'm sorry, you say, no problem. You're forgiven. But it, you have to take every circumstance into consideration. It's not an absolute. It is an overstatement of an ideal. So, and if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what honor is that to you? Say, well, let me do a credit check on you before I give you five bucks. And say, well, you look hungry. I'm going to loan you five dollars. If you can pay me back, fine. If you can't, don't worry about it. But it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. If you say, I'm going to loan you a million dollars out of my business to start your business, and I'm going to do a credit check to see if you can pay it back, that's only fair and reasonable. But if it's the poor and the needy, there's a different way you approach it. And that's, so here again, Jesus is going for the meaning, not the literal statement viewed in a narrow, constrictive way. And, and people have misinterpreted this to their own hurt, to their own harm, needlessly. It says, even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Yeah, with good credit. I would, a sinner will loan to a sinner. A sinner won't loan to a sinner unless that other sinner has good credit, let me guarantee you, or else they're going to, they're going to break their kneecaps. Well, you know, we kind of read between the lines here and understand there's more going on than is being said. Verse 35, but love your enemies. How do you love them? Do good to them. Do good to your enemies especially those who persecute you for being a Christian. You know, I had a situation happen to me one time as a pastor. I took a youth group out to a park uh, for a morning of activities. There were volleyball nets in the park. And so we had all these teenagers. We probably had about 50, 75 teenagers out playing volleyball. Well, you know what? They made a lot of noise. It's a park with volleyball nets and the teenagers were playing and made a lot of noise. Well, one of the neighbors came over and uh, they brought him to me. And they said, he wanted to know who's in charge, pastor. And I said, well, I'm the pastor here. And he said, you call yourself a pastor of Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I am. Oh, these kids are making too much noise. I said, well, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll ask them to quiet it down. Well, you better just get up and get out of here. I'm going to call the police. I said, Sorry, it's just teenagers playing volleyball at a volleyball courts in the park. I don't care. I, you get out of here. I hate all of you. I hate your stupid religion, and I hate all of you, and I'm going to call the cops. And I thought about it. You know, the teenagers, as you can imagine, are gathering around by this time thinking, hey, what's Pastor Dad going to do? And I thought, well, you know, i got to set a right example here, do the right. I said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. We'll try to hold down the noise. We've got a nice lunch plan. Would, would you care to join us for some food? Oh, he got, his face turned red. You talk about heaping coals of fire on someone. I thought he was going to explode like a volcano. And he spit on me, spit right in my face. Now, I admit to being a bit of a germaphobe, and let me tell you, that really, really bothered me. And again, the teenagers were like, whoa, now Pastor Dad's going to get him. I took my handkerchief out, I wiped my face, and I said, you're still welcome for lunch. Oh, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. And man, he almost went into a, an epileptic seizure at that point. He couldn't even, and he wandered away. Bless you, my friend. <laughs> and the teenagers were like, wow, we really learned a lesson today. I'm, I'm glad. You know, we don't want people to be our enemies. We want them to be our friends. We want them to repent. 
and they may repent. And you'd feel really bad if you did something bad to someone who you thought was your enemy and later found out they'd become a Christian. So you have to think about how you treat people, but that doesn't mean you act stupid either. Now, if the man had pulled a gun, I would have reacted quite differently. If he'd pulled a knife or if he'd physically attacked me, circumstances mitigate the instructions. But when you can, understand the meaning and behave accordingly to the overall point that Jesus was making here. As he says to them, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expect getting anything back, then your reward will be great. And you will be the children of the Most High. Why? Because he, God, is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Have you ever been unkind? Have you ever been ungrateful? Have you ever been wicked? Yeah. How did God treat you? He kept working with me, giving me time to change, repent. Thank God he did. I thank God he did. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So be merciful. Just as your father is merciful. What has God done for you? How do you want to do for others? But now wait. What did God do to the folks in Sodom and Gomorrah? Whoa, he destroyed them. How do I understand that? Well, first of all, those people were evidently so wicked and evil that they were hurting themselves and about to hurt other people. That's not good for anybody. Not good for them, not good for others. So what did God do? Well, in a certain situation, at a certain time, in a certain place, for certain reasons, God did that. But now, wait a minute. God can resurrect people. You and I can't. I kill someone, I can't do a thing about it except say, take me to jail. God is righteous. He can kill and he can make alive. And you know what Jesus said about the folks in Sodom and Gomorrah? He said they're going to rise up in the day of judgment and condemn some of you people who think you were so religious. It's not the end of them. They, they'll have a new beginning. And when they come up, you know what? They're going to say, I didn't understand. I didn't know. And God's going to say, now you do. Now, how are you going to respond? So it's, it's a different situation, but God is going to be merciful, folks, to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He is going to be merciful and it's going to be tolerable for them in the day of judgment. Because God is compassionate. So are there times when execution, the death penalty is appropriate? Well, I'm sad to say maybe there is. Why? For the good of the person being executed who does not need to live that way any longer and for the good of all those who that person might harm. But you know what? That person is going to come up in the resurrection and stand before Jesus Christ someday because God is compassionate and God is merciful. But different things may happen, have to happen now than happened then. God told the Israelites to destroy some of the Gentile nations before them, every man, woman, and child. And people say, well, uh, why in the world would God do that? Well, those people were so evil that they were hurting each other, and they were hurting their children, they were hurting others, they had done horrible things to God's people, and so God said, all right, if you're going to, I would take care of them, but if you're going to take care of them, then here's what you got to do, you got to take care of all of them, please. So there are times when God does that, but God is God of compassion, and he has, he will resurrect people, and he will show them love and compassion, if they're willing to accept it and to receive it. So God can do things we can't do, so we gotta be careful, we're not God. But we ought to act like God in the terms of compassion 
and forgiveness and generosity. Beginning in verse 37, we've got two prohibitions and two co commands with their consequences. Verse 37, do not judge. Do not judge others. What does he mean by that? He's talking about here in context human criticism. Not righteous judgment. God judges people righteously. We ought to judge righteous judgment, but not judge in the sense of just criticize people on a human level of criticism. And it doesn't mean don't judge people in a court of law. It's not talking about that. The context here is criticizing others. Don't judge them. Don't condemn, and you will not be condemned. Don't say, go to hell. I wouldn't say that to someone. Ever. Not just because it's a little phrase that gets thrown about, because you don't want to tell someone to go to Gehenna. That's condemning them. That's condemnation. You want them to repent. You want them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Even if they're a murderer today, you want to see them repent and accept Jesus as their Savior. You do not want anyone to go to Gehenna because you don't want to go there. That's the way you treat others as yourself. Don't judge. Don't condemn. Forgive. That's our word. Remember the word? Offices. Remember the Greek word? Offices. Forgive. Release set free, and you will be released, forgiven, set free by God. Give, and it will be given to you by God. Not always by others, but you trust in God. If you give to others, you may not get anything in return. Don't say give, and it'll be given. That's not what it means. But God will always honor you for generosity. And how will God respond to your kindness, your compassion, your generosity towards others? This is how God will respond. God will respond like a, like a very generous merchant. If you go into a grain store and you order a bushel basket of grain, the merchant could just pour the grain in the basket and hand it to you. Or the merchant could pour it in pat it down, pour some more in, pat it down, pour some more in, spill it over the top and let you, let you catch it in the hem of your garment. And you're walking out with a hem full of grain and a basket full of grain, and that's a, that's a nice merchant. I want to shop here more often. He's very generous with his approach. And that's what he's talking about here. Give it, it will be given to you by God. A good measure, metron, from which we get the word meter, metric. A good measure, metron, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you by God. Did you not read in the Lord's Prayer that forgive others as you want them to forgive? to forgive you, forgive others, as you want God to forgive your debts? Yeah. Are you a harsh judge? Do you want to be judged harshly? I don't think so. So we need to deal with others the way we want God to deal with us. So what do we conclude from this section of Jesus' Sermon on the Level Place? How do we correctly interpret his teaching and how do we apply in our lives as Christians? Okay, let's get the main point. Here's the meaning. Here's the point of overstatement. Here's the point of emphasis. We should love others. All others, without exception. We should reflect the compassion, mercy, and forgiveness of God. The way that God has grace and love and mercy and forgiveness for all. Our attitude and response to others should be godly. 
We should not seek vengeance, retaliation, retribution, payback when we are wronged by others. No lex talionis, no eye for an eye, no quid pro quo. However, God's love also encompasses justice and righteous judgment. That's part of God's love, too. We love and forgive people, but we do not condone their evil actions. It is not loving to tell people who are hurting themselves, that's okay, that's all right, I don't judge. Well, there's times for righteous judgment, not just human criticism, but there's time for righteous judgment for people's own good. It's not loving to tell people who are hurting themselves by sinning that their actions and behavior are okay. We can't let them get away with it. In what sense? They're going to hurt themselves. So we have to say or do something. We must speak the truth in love. For evildoers' own good, as well as the good of their possible victims, if it may be prudent to rebuke them, even to restrain them, and when appropriate, call upon law enforcement officials or other responsible officials to take care of the situation. You know, if you're a law enforcement official and you carry a gun, there may come a day when you have to fire that weapon. And you can imagine someone saying, well, I'm trying to be a good Christian as a law enforcement official. You shot me in my shoulder. Here, shoot me in the other one. That's not turning the other cheek or the other shoulder. That's, that's not what it's talking about. And as a police officer, if they shoot at you, you may have to shoot back because innocent bystanders may get hit. You may be killed. So you shoot them. Then what do you do? Well, have you seen good examples of this in television movies? They're bad examples, but the good examples are the officer immediately rushes up and says, put pressure on that wound. Send me an ambulance right away. We've got a man down to a gunshot wound. Get him right here right away. We've got to get him to the hospital. So, officer, you just shot the guy. Yeah, but I'm not trying to really hurt him or kill him. I care about him, and I want him to get well. I did what I had to do to keep more bad from happening. Bad for him and bad for others and bad for me. He's not going to profit if I just stand there and let him shoot me. If I let him shoot other people, that's not good. I did what I had to do, but I certainly was not trying to kill him. No quid pro quo. No eye for an eye. I just had to stop him, and I hope I didn't kill him. I don't want to. And now that I've wounded him, I'm going to try to save his life. This is the meaning of what Jesus is saying here. Uh, the opposite would be, well, police officer, you shot me in the shoulder. Yeah, now I'm going to put five in your head. No. That's a criminal act. So God believes in justice and righteousness. Jesus' teaching and the Sermon on the Plain are godly ideals, godly ideals that do not prescribe required actions in every detail and in every circumstance. The teachings call for love, but they also call for wisdom in their interpretation and application. We should not make strict rules out of spiritual principles. If we make strict absolute rules, we enact a form of legalism not love. <laughs> you know, the irony is that we can judge people by judging. Don't you love it when someone says, I, uh, I don't go to church, you know why? Because Christians are just too judgmental. Now yeah, that's my judgment. I've just judged them for being too judgmental. And you know, I've always condemned people who are judgmental. You don't want to make hard and fast rules out of spiritual principles. Jesus' teachings do not mean that Christians should let people take advantage of them. 
or reward them when they do. It's not what he's saying. Just like God, we are to love and forgive others, especially those in our own Christian community. However, just as with God, we know that some sinners will persist in their sins. Just as with God, we also recognize that not all will accept our love and forgiveness. And those who do not, just as with God, will remain in alienation from us. But we still love them. We just may have to love them from a distance. So in Jesus' teachings and his sermon on the level place, he set some extremely high standards for Christian attitude and conduct, and we need to take those high standards seriously. But we also need to understand what they mean, not just what they say. Through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, and by God's grace, you and I are to become perfect as God is perfect. Talk about an overstatement. But it's a worthy overstatement. To become perfect as God is perfect and to walk as Jesus walked. Let us draw close to God, love Him, and love our neighbor. And may the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit be in us. We're going to need that as we seek to apply the teachings of Jesus Christ in our lives and love all of us.